Hey everybody, welcome back to Candlelight Stroll, where we profile paranormal hotspots in the tri-state area. And as always, we are your hosts, Marcus D. And Vic Waitley. And okay everybody, bolt your windows and grab your guns, because we're diving into the Hopkinsville Goblins. On August 21st, 1955, Billy Ray Taylor was visiting the home of Elmer Lucky Sutton and his family in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. While collecting water outside, Billy Ray runs into the home, telling his family that he had witnessed a flying saucer landing not too far away. As would to be expected, his family ridiculed him for it, but they would soon regret doing so. Not too long after seeing the flying saucer, Billy Ray Taylor and Lucky Sutton go outside to investigate a disturbance. They encountered a three to four foot tall silver humanoid creature with large bat-like ears and yellow eyes, began to walk out of the woods with its hands up, as if to surrender. As is the local custom, they immediately grabbed their guns and began shooting at the creature. Strangely, the pair of men swore they hit the creature, who was only about 20 feet away, but the creature simply did a backflip and fled into the woods. Believing the situation was over, the men returned to their family inside. Not too long after though, the creature, or one similar to it, began to look through the window at the family. The men shot at the creature through the window leaving holes in the window in the surrounding wall. Believing the creature dead, the men went outside to retrieve the body, but were soon startled by a silver hand reaching down to grab at them from the roof. The men continued to fire at the creature, but it simply hovered to the ground and returned to the woods. Over the course of three hours, the family was constantly harassed by these creatures, coming from the woods with their hands held in the air, peering into the home, then fleeing back to the woods. Oddly enough, the creatures never tried to enter the home. The family claimed to have shot these creatures several times, but only amounted to the sound that they likened to shoot in uh, the bottom of, t of a tin pail. All in all, the family claimed to have been taunted by at least three or more of these creatures. Due to the creatures' continued presence, the family flees the home and rushes to report the incident to the local police. Fearing a firefight was occurring between local families, Sheriff Russell Greenwell, state troopers, and even four military police from the nearby Fort Campbell went to investigate the home. During the investigation, law enforcement found several bullet holes, but none of the creatures were seen by law enforcement. The police did find a luminescent substance on a nearby fence and observed a green glowing light in the woods, but didn't investigate it further. Sheriff Greenwell stated he believed the family was sober, but visibly shaken. Without finding anything they could do, law enforcement left around 2.15 a.m. The family stated 90 minutes later, the creatures returned and continued their strange tease and behavior. Gunfire rang through the night until just before sunrise, when the creatures vanished, never to be seen again by the family. Okay, Vic, so how credible is the source here? How credible is the family? Because as we all know, when you're looking at a paranormal story, the credibility of the source is paramount. It's a huge part of this. Well, one of the first things I'd say is the sheriff who came out to assess the situation, he attested that the family appeared to be sober and drug-free. Yeah, and what struck me was that all of the family members were consistent with their stories. And when you listen to law enforcement talk about how they do investigations, one of the things that they do when they go out is they, they try to get people to stick to their story. Because if people are lying, the story's not going to match up or it's going to be inconsistent over time. And beyond that, when they got there to uh, investigate the situation, they separated out the three people who primarily uh, saw them. That'd be Lucky, uh, Billy Ray, and their mother. When asked to describe the creatures, they all gave very, very similar uh, facsimiles of them. Only very slight variations about what you would expect from anyone who's been through a situation along these lines. But ultimately, the descriptions were eerily similar. And when you guys look at uh, the story of the family, most of the time when you have sources that you don't think are credible, we always think people are just trying to 
create a story for the fame. They're trying to get they're trying to get rich. I mean, we've all we've all probably encountered stories like that. But the family didn't want this, did they? No, they actually uh, were very displeased by the amount of media attention they ended up getting from it, and went so far to even sell the house not long after this happened, just to get away from the media harassment. So, what makes this story unique? Because when when you're looking at a paranormal story, why, you know, what makes this interesting? Well, one of the first things that strikes me is the movement of the creatures. They're described as taking the sort of motion that one would take when wading through water. They're also described not to actually walk on the ground, but slightly hover above it. Beyond that, their appearance is fairly unique. I've not really heard of an encounter with a creature that looks quite like these. The large eyes, the large ears, and particularly the feet, described as being uh, not like a foot where ours attaches in the back and then moves forward, more like going down to just a circle of a platform supporting the body. And and what strikes me as odd is, is in this, the creatures never enter the home. And these creatures were a constant family for like several hours, like over four hours, this family was being seeing these creatures come up to the to the windows, come up to the door, and all this, and look at them. And you hear from the story that it, it didn't look like they were affected by being shot. So it's not like they could really stop them if they wanted to go in the home. And even if they were curious, which is something a lot of people say about this, you'd think they'd be curious enough to go into the home where they are. Definitely very strange. Yeah. So Marcus, what is it that the skeptics have to say about this? What I love about this story is it gives the best funny skeptics response that I have ever heard. Normally the skeptics get to make fun of us believers for the crazy stuff that we say, but in this situation we get to say about the skeptics. One of the funniest things that I've ever heard a skeptic say is that the Hopkinsville Coughlins were silver painted monkeys that the family ran into. I kid you not, it is out there, look it up. Yep. It was. And, I mean, there's there's some, a little, there, there's a little bit of, you know, I guess a caveat there, because there was, like, at least, like, what, 80-some-odd miles away here in Evansville, there was a carnival going on at the time. I still don't see the monkeys I, painted silver making that like, trip, particularly think, across the Ohio River. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that, too, and I think that, too, it was, they could probably shoot a monkey. I, I think they <laughs> I think they succeed. One thing you can definitely say about good old boys, they got a pretty good aim. And... Still, the other thing that's just weird, why would anybody paint a monkey silver? I, I don't know. <laughs> that, that I'm really not sure on. Some other explanations are uh, that they were misidentifying cats. But, once again, I think some good old boys shooting at some cats. First, I think they'd recognize the cats. And I'm pretty sure those shotguns would have turned those into little piles of fluff. And some people say owls, but I'd say pretty much the exact same answer. They're, these are people who are used to living out in that area. They're going to recognize local animals like cats and owls. And of course, I mean, there's a, there's always the theory that they were what drunk, that that they were just drinking. Yeah, but I think the intervention by the sheriff pretty much throws that one out. And I think if you were drunk enough to, and I mean, and I, we've all a lot of us out there, we've all been drunk enough that we've told a wild story. I think if you were drunk enough to say, oh my god, there's 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 aliens out there at Silver Eyes. And all this, I, I don't think you'd be sober enough to drive your car to the local police station and then get them to come out to your house. I think they would just keep you there. And a big part of what made the police want to investigate this was the sincerity of their account. But I think it's important, no guys, when the, the real serious skeptic response to the Hopkinsville Goblins was that these were great horned owls. Well, great horned owls do generally fit the size requirement, but I mean... Living in this area, it's not uncommon to see them. And when you see them, you generally know what you're looking at. But you know, they have a fairly distinct hooting sound that, well, you're probably going to hear them before you see them, and you're going to know what's going yeah. on. And, and and what was it, either Lucky or, or Billy, I'm not sure which one. He had the he had a shotgun, and I'm pretty sure that you could peg a three-foot owl with a shotgun. <laughs> Particularly if it's on the ground. Yeah, I, I think you're going to get it. Okay, now we get to talk about our favorite part, which is what do we think they are? And I think first we'll approach probably the non-UFO part. You know, does the lore say this could be anything else, Vic? Well, the only thing I can really think of from the lore that may fit this sort of description is something from the sort of fey pantheon of creatures. Well, 
They possessed abnormal uh, abilities of movement. They were luminescent. They possessed goblin-like cre- uh, like features, which goblins are generally considered a sort of fae in folklore. But I, mean, with the presence of the UFO and things like that, I don't think it's as realistic as some of the others. But uh, this is connected so, to one of our other favorite cases, isn't it? Yes, it is connected to the Green Clawed Beast. Uh, it's a very popular uh, cryptid uh, subject here in Evansville. And we're going to put a link below because we did a whole video about this that you guys can check out. Um, in this, this Green Clawed Beast creature reaches up while underwater and grabs a swimmer by the leg, leaving this green uh, phosphorus luminescent mark on her leg uh, that lasted for several days afterwards which in the Hopkinsville Goblin story you know there was this green phosphorus substance that was found on the local fence and a green glow that was seen out there and really what makes me think that this could be connected to the green clawed beast is this happens on the exact same day as the green clawed beast report here in Evansville, Indiana now if I was going to play skeptic here and I'm going to go out on a limb on this one and normally that's my job but go ahead if I was going to say, if they saw something natural, I think what would have happened was a local creature, perhaps a great horned owl, had gotten into some fox fire, which is a type of glowing fungus. Somehow this creature became confused, maybe strangled, that's why it wasn't making any sound, and in its confusion just kept approaching the house. Now, I don't think this is especially likely, but this would probably be the closest to a plausible answer I can think of. I think we're both of one mind here that this is most likely some sort of UFO alien based encounter. Taking that into consideration, what does that say about what occurred? My my argument is going to be that I think the Hopkinsville Goblin UFOs are juvenile aliens. And the reason that I'm going to give this is because their behavior strikes me as juvenile. These are creatures that, being shot at for several hours, um, didn't appear to get hurt by the gunfire. And yet, they continued hearing some sort of light noise, and yet they're, they're skittish for several hours. I think that if this was a more intelligent, self, self-aware self entity, I don't think that they would have that skittish reaction to being shot at, which is what seemed to happen with the Hopkinsville Goblins, but a child not aware fully of what it's able to do probably... That it maybe it wouldn't know. My first thought is we may be dealing with something that's not a biological entity. We may be talking about some sort of drone, some sort of automaton. I mainly say that because of the tinny sound that was made when uh, when they were shot at. I think these could have been things sent out to scout out the uh, behavior of the locals to see if it may be safe for biological organisms to set foot out. Does it take four hours and several gunshots for them to discover these people are hostile, though? Well, they may have been trying to discover more than just that. They may have been trying to uh, establish a set of behaviors. But at that, I don't think this is a perfect theory, just one of the things that comes to mind. The tinny sound could have also been the effect of the bullets hitting some sort of shielding mechanism. Hey guys, thank you for viewing this video. As always, we appreciate everyone who takes the time to watch our videos we hope you guys had a really great time watching this because i know that we had a great time making it for you and if you enjoyed it don't forget to like share and subscribe and if you have an idea what you want to hear us talk about next just leave it in the comments below and great news guys you can now follow one candle society on instagram i'm popping up here so that you guys can see our name on here if you guys want to see our day-to-day thoughts our day-to-day activities on instagram check out some pics check us out And as always, keep believing, because we'll keep listening.